All right. Good morning, church. Let's all stand and worship the Lord together.
you may, you may all be seated as we pray for tithes and offering this morning. Well, good morning, church family. Blessed that you guys could join with us this morning <sighs> in a nation where we still can gather together and still hit in and out on the way home. What a great nation, huh? Um, we are so blessed here. Uh, would you guys join with me as we pray for our morning tithes and offerings? Father, we just are so blessed, this facility and all the things that you've provided, uh, that we could gather together in your name, Lord, as a family and worship you, to sing praises to you, uh, to learn from your word. And so, Lord, we, we ask this morning that you would bless our tithes and offerings so that we could keep doing these things. Pray you would give this staff wisdom in what to do with the funds, Lord. Uh, give them insight and understanding, Lord. Um, your word tells us that you love a cheerful giver, so let us do this with a right heart, Lord, because uh, you're not in need of anything from anyone. It's our blessing to give. So we ask, Lord, you just go before us, uh, bless our, our offerings, and bless the service, and we'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. 
let's all stand for this last song. seated as we do this morning's announcements. Good morning. 
Welcome to Calvary Chapel, the High Desert. If this is your first time here with us, would you raise your hand up? We'd like to welcome anybody here for the first time this morning. Awesome. Well, welcome. We've got a few things to go over with you. I'd like to point out to you if you are here for the first time or if you've never filled one of these out, we have these connect cards that are on the pews right in front of you. Uh, unless you're in the front row, then you have to go to the back row and they're on the back of those seats. So, okay, follow that. But anyway, you can fill this out. Let us know who you are and that you came here to the church to fellowship and you're just uh, reaching out and letting us know that. We'll do the same in turn and reach out to you and try and connect with you a little bit better as a big church body, trying to help us uh, feel a little bit smaller in that way. So please fill that out. Also, if you open up your bulletins, we have a few things to go over with you, and I'd like to just share uh, some of the things that we've got going on all through the week. So encourage you to um, consider coming out this Wednesday. Pastor Dennis is continuing his study in the book of Romans. So that's a, a great study time to get in the word and, and fellowship again. Also on Wednesday nights, we have a high school and junior high fellowship. So if you have a junior high or high school age uh, child at home, you can encourage them to come out for that. We've been blessed with an awesome a pastor for each one of those age groups, a pastor for high school, a pastor for junior high, leaders, and there's just a lot of fruit coming out of that ministry, so just encourage you to get involved with that. And then you can see we also have men's study, women's study. We have a bite study on Thursday evening, which is open to men and women, transformed on Friday evening. So there's lots of opportunity for you to get involved. Um, if you noticed any of the men walking around today like hobbling like this or exercising their shoulders, it was because of pickleball yesterday. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see them. They're out there. Um, but we had over 50 guys come out for pickleball yesterday. And yeah, it was really cool. We had a great time. Lots of people. Most, there was one pickleballer. We had more than that. But uh, it was really encouraging because we spent a lot of time in fellowship and just uh, hanging out with one another, getting to be a little bit closer, and then a little physical activity. And the cool thing was most everybody that came out had never played before. So we got to teach people how to play pickleball. You saw the uh, high school uh, I'm still in high school. I played tennis when I was in high school. I can do this. And it was great to see people just having a great time in the Lord and in fellowship with one another. So lots of things going on. A couple uh, things to let you know about. Topical Sunday nights. Last Sunday, uh, Pastor Daniel taught on reading versus studying your Bible and how you need to be doing both of them and how to do both of them. Uh, the next one is on May 5th, and Pastor Aaron is going to be sharing with you some of the tools to use to study your Bible better, like using commentaries, cross-referencing, concordance, and that kind of things, what those words mean, what they even are, and just to help you dig deeper into the Word. So I encourage you to come out on May 5th. And then you also see the uh, Africa Missions Trip 2024 is set. We've got a team of 11 that are going out. If you'd like to be... Awesome. Yeah, we're very excited to see what the Lord's going to do there. I will tell you, it's going to be an incredible work of the Lord because there's already been an incredible work of the enemy trying to discourage and keep the team from being able to move forward. So we want to encourage you guys to be praying for the team because that's what we can use the most is prayer for the team that's going. If you are able to um, support the team in any way, whether it's sponsoring one of the 11 that's going or helping to buy medical supplies for the medical mission, that would be great. Just be in prayer about that and how you can get involved. And if you want some more information or you want to donate, you can do that in the church bookstore. And then one last thing, VBS was in the bulletin first time last week, just to let you know about it. This week, we're letting you know that we're going to be taking the ministry questionnaires for that, or ministry applications for that, if you'd like to get involved in help. So this would be a great opportunity, if you're not serving anywhere else in the church right now, for you to just kind of try something out for a week, see how it feels, <laughs> you'll be encouraged, you can take that step to get involved, and I guarantee you, you'll be blessed. But anyway, if any of you past, present, uh, or have served before, encourage you to fill out one of those uh, applications. You can turn them into the church bookstore. Amen? All right. For uh, the next two minutes, if you guys would stand up, go around, greet one another, say hello, Pastor Chris will be right out.
Well, good morning. Good morning, church. Take your seats, and uh, we have a baby dedication before Pastor Chris comes and teaches. And so let's see if he'll come to me. This is my grandson. He's eight months old. His name is Dawson Ezekiel Davenport. What do you think, Dawson? Want to say hi to anybody? <laughs> Your eyes are going crossed. Why? <laughs> no, he's going to eat it. <laughs> That's what they do at that age. Right? I love you, buddy. We're going to pray and dedicate little Dawson to the Lord. Children are a gift from the Lord. And so we're, I'm, I'm blessed to have 16 grandchildren. All of these plus, there's the youngest, he was the youngest, but now there's a new one, Mary. She is in Hawaii, and she's the youngest. Oh, there you go. That's a way to do it. You're going to take over. Okay, well, let's pray and dedicate Dawson to the Lord before he uh, tears the place apart. Lord, we are so grateful. I'm blessed, Lord, and uh, we are blessed to uh, be a family, Lord, with uh, the grandchildren. And, and God, I just pray for little Dawson now, Lord, that you would just, God, as you've had your hand on him, Lord, and just knitting him together in Alyssa's womb, Lord, and, and just blessed uh, this family, Lord, with him. I pray, Lord, that you would just help him to grow to be a godly man, that you would put a hedge of protection around him. And Lord, that his mind from his early days, Lord, would be filled with your word and your truth, Lord, and that he would be uh, a, a young man, Lord, as he grows with the, the, the heart, Lord, for you. And uh, just to be a man that glorifies and honors your name. And I pray, Lord, that you would give to Alyssa and John wisdom, Lord, to see his giftings and to be able to encourage him in those things. And Lord, to see his weaknesses and be able to help him, Lord, deal with those areas, Lord, as they pray for him and, and just read your word to him. So Lord, make him a man after God's own heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There you go, buddy. All right, well, welcome with me, Pastor Chris Mathis. Well, good morning, church. If you uh, have your Bible, and I hope you do, you want to go ahead and find Matthew chapter 7 this morning. Matthew chapter 7. As we continue in our study through the Sermon on the Mount, we're kind of coming to the close here. Matthew chapter 7 of this greatest sermon ever. We're going to pick up where we left off in verse 13. Our text this morning will be verse 13 and 14. The title of the message this morning is The Decision. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. Uh, we're going to read our text and then we'll spend some time in prayer, but we're going to pray for uh, our high school students. There's about 130 high school students that spent the weekend at uh, winter camp, and we're going to pray that they come back changed, that the Lord did a work in them. Uh, for any of you parents that sent a high school student to camp, they're coming back. <laughs> they will return. And uh, our prayer is that, you know what, they turn a little bit, or they return a little further down the road in the process of uh, Christ likeness. So uh, we'll pray for them. But here we are, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Will you bow for a moment of prayer? Father, we come before you and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness throughout this week and your faithfulness to bring us back here uh, again this Sunday 
to worship you, to gather amongst other like-minded believers in Christ, and to open up your word that we have in our own language. We thank you, Lord, that we gather here because you have sent your only begotten Son, because Christ has died for us, because Christ is risen. And Lord, we ask that Christ would return and return soon. Father, as we look for the returning of your Son, we, Lord, uh, pause and, and ask, Father, that you would bring peace in Jerusalem. We know, Lord, that your word calls us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and Father, we want to bring that before you. As we understand from your word that you, God, are faithful to your people, that your nation Israel, you will keep all of your promises, you have not forgotten a one, and they are the apple of your eye. But Lord, we know from your word that as the nations attack, as those that surround them uh, want them to be extinguished, that you, Father, will use all such things to bring them uh, to yourself. And so, Father, we pray that they would look unto Jesus and find salvation. We ask, Father, that you would do a work of the gospel by your Spirit in the Middle East, that men and women would trust in Christ, and that we would see the blessing and the peace that comes when nations are right with you. Lord, we ask that you would be with all of those high school students that are returning from a weekend at camp. Lord, our heart and desire is that you would do a work of change in their life, that they would be better followers of you, more committed to uh, following your word and surrendering wholeheartedly to you. Lord, we pray that you would raise up from the youth of this church future pastors and teachers and missionaries, future worship leaders, uh, Lord, um, mighty men and women to be used for the furtherance of your gospel. And so thank you for what you're doing in the young and the old in Calvary Chapel of the High Desert. Lord, we give you our attention now and ask that you would take these two verses and that you, Lord, would drive your truth like a well-driven stake into our hearts, that we would be men and women that live for you and make the decision of life to follow after your son. Save any that are lost, do a work by your spirit of revealing what Christ has done, that any in need of forgiveness can be washed. We give you this time now, in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. There were two poets, one by the name of Robert and the other one by the name of Edward, that enjoyed to go on walks as friends. They would regularly go out and, and walk around the neighborhood, walk around the area in which they lived, and, and talk about life and the different things going on. But they would come to a moment where they'd have to decide which way to go. And one of the particular poets, Edward, he always struggled making a decision. Do we go right or do we go straight? You know, do we go a little bit longer or do we start to turn back? And it, it kind of bothered his friend Robert. Robert was always kind of frustrated. You never make a decision. And then when he would make it and they would go right, they'd walk down the road a ways and he'd begin to second guess his decision. He couldn't make it up. He was, in, he was indecisive. It was like, oh, we should have went straight. Oh, we should have went right. We should have turned around. Maybe you've been in one of those moments. You go out on a walk and you get a, a ways out and you said to yourself, we should have turned back. This is hard. Well, Robert and Edward dealt with that. Robert finally came to a point where he had kind of had enough of his friend and he thought he'd kind of make fun of him a little bit. And so he wrote a poem as a joke to his friend Edward. He had wrote the poem, he sent it to Edward, and he, being a poet, had a few reading sessions where he had read the poem, and he ended up writing to Edward and saying, you know, I've, I've read this poem to groups, and they just don't see the funny uh, aspect in it. They don't see any joke in it, and even Edward was like, you know, I don't see it very funny, um, because he was kind of the brunt of it. However, this poem has gone on to be something that I'm sure all of you have heard. What was supposed to be a joke actually became a, a well-read poem 
the author, Robert Frost. The poem, The Road Not Taken. You may remember from even early childhood when you heard the first stanza, two roads diverge in a yellow wood. And I, and sorry I, could not travel both. And be one traveler long I stood and looked down on as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. You may remember the last stanza, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. What was supposed to be a joke turned out to be a, a classic poem that I can even remember in elementary school having to illustrate it with crayon and paper, the two roads. But there's something that's not very funny about it. It's the reality of life that we are faced with decisions. That we have moments where it's like we're at a fork in the road and we have to make a decision. And as we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has given us so much information and now he comes to the point where he's like, it's time to make a decision. And if you want to look, starting in verse 13 to the end of the sermon, down into verse 28, we will see over the next few weeks, Jesus give us instruction or call us to decision. You notice in our text this morning, verse 13 and 14, we are faced with the decision of life. We'll spend our time this morning looking at that decision of life as we are kind of at a, a fork in the road. Then in next week, we'll jump into verse 15 down into 23, and we'll see the second decision after the, the Lord has given the sermon, and we will see the decision of our influences. And then the final week, the decision of our foundation. You, you see the, the rock or the sand. What are we going to build our house upon? Jesus is ending the greatest sermon ever with the call to decision. Now, this, is, this call to decision is very common in the Scripture. It's not like new with Jesus. Jesus, in following that line that He's laid out in the sermon, I've come to fulfill the law, to fulfill the prophets, not to abolish it. He sticks with that line. When He calls you to a decision of life this morning... He falls in line with what you see throughout Scripture. There's Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, in verse 15, Joshua is addressing the Israelites. And, and he tells them, choose this day whom you will serve. He says, you can choose to serve the, the gods on the other side of the river. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Like there was a choice. The first Psalm, Psalm chapter 1, right? Uh, the psalmist David, he lays out kind of a decision between the righteous and the unrighteous. And as you come to the end of the psalm, you see that choice in Psalm chapter 1 and verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. You see that choice. There's the righteous and the unrighteous. You have to make a decision. And so as we come to verse 13 and 14, I want you to walk through this decision of life. And there are three questions for life that we're going to ask the text. The first question is, where, where do I start? That would be the entrance. You'll notice in verse 13 and 14, there's gates. Like, where do I start? Where's the entrance? The second question we're going to ask the text is, how do I get there? I'm, I'm going somewhere. How do I get there? That's the path. If you look at verse 13 and 14, you see there's a broad way and there's a difficult way. There's paths. How, how do I get there? And the third question we're going to ask the text is, where am I going? What's the destination? And you'll look in verse 13 and verse 14, and you see that there's, there's two destinations. There's life and there's destruction. And so we have three questions for life to help us make our decision as we are kind of at the fork in the road. Now, we're not in a, an autumn situation or scene of a, a yellow wood. We are at the decision, at the descent of the Sermon on the Mount to choose between life and death. So let's start at the entrance. Where do I start? A very good uh, choice to, uh, question to ask. Where do I start? And you see Jesus does something here that should be very beneficial to us today in 2024. He gives us two choices. That's it. Many of you are going to go to lunch after this. And you're going to go into a restaurant. And you are going to have way more than two choices. Or you're going to be overwhelmed with a menu that's like a, a small novel of all of the options. Right? You, you have here, though, when it comes to life, Jesus narrows it down, and he gives us two choices. 
Where do I start this entrant? You start with the reality that you stand with not multiple choices, but with two. He descends down and gives you two options, and you find that these options are set up by two different gates. Notice in the text, verse 13, you see both of them. There's the narrow gate, and then there's the wide gate. You'll walk through it, and you see that these, this choice are two, and they follow along. You have a wide gate or a narrow gate, right? We say narrow or wide. Then you see that that narrow gate is attached to a difficult way, and the wide gate is attached to a broad way. Then to go further down to see you just have two choices, the narrow gate to the difficult way, it leads to life. But then you have the wide gate and the broad way, and it's attached to a destination of destruction. So where do I start? I start with realizing I have two choices, two options. Do I go narrow or do I go wide? Look at this in the text in verse 13. It says, enter by the narrow gate. That word narrow there speaks of being restrictive or confined. It's, it's one of those gates that if you're not comfortable with small spaces, you, you kind of you get a sense that your heart rate just elevates hearing about it. It's a narrowness that you try to walk through the gate, you're going to feel the ends brush on your side. You, you try to make it through, you've got to like, okay, suck it in, let's go. <laughs> Right? To, to wiggle your way through, there's a, there's a narrowness that is laid out in your first choice. This narrowness, you might think of how it might test your patience. Everybody bottlenecks to this. It doesn't free flow. You come down, it's like, why are we waiting? Because the gate is narrow. Look at the second choice. It's the wide gate. Oh, this is the gate it's wide and easy and comfortable. There's no restriction. It's free-flowing. I mean, to be honest, this wide gate and Broadway, this is what every Californian dreams the highways were like. <laughs> like, would it not be amazing if we could describe the Cajon Pass as the wide gate? <laughs> that would be lovely, right? Like everybody has their own lane. You get a lane. You get a lane. Like it's just free flowing. That's that idea of wide. It, it really in our heart, it's what every Southern California resident wishes the freeways were like. Now pause here and see you have two choices. It really lets you know something that we face in this world where you hear things like, well, there are many roads to God. All roads and ways lead to God. I just, I'm going to off-road my way to Jesus. <laughs> but look at what Jesus lays out here in the decision. He's like, you have two choices. You have narrow or you have wide. Now, to see that Jesus is sticking with what he's laid out, that he is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, that he has not abolished it, that it all points to him, you find this two decision throughout Scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 21 and verse 8, Jeremiah, the Lord says, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. How many decisions? One decision, two choices. The way of life, the way of death. In Deuteronomy 28, there's this moment where the Lord kind of lays down the decision. If you choose to obey me, there's all of these blessings. You choose to disobey me. Here's all of the curses that will come upon you. Do you see like the, the two choices? You have two Jesus puts it as wide, or he puts it as narrow. Notice something else you find. You must choose. Where do I start? I start with realizing I have a choice, and there's two options. There's two possibilities, but I must choose. Do you see in verse 13, you're, you're instructed, enter by the narrow gate, like Jesus is telling you which one to choose. He's telling you which one is the one that's best. He's telling you which one is the one that, that the sermon, as it culminates here in our decision, choose the narrow gate. You must choose. You can't sit on the, the sidelines and go, I'll see how it works out. I'm just going to hang out here, camp out by the fork in the road. No, enter. There's a call to choose. There's a call to action. Look at this next aspect. You have two choices. You have or you must choose, but you see very clearly there is a right choice. You find in verse 13 that Jesus tells you that the right choice, enter the narrow gate. 
then he describes the wide gate and the, wide, and the broad road. He, he, he gives you some detail about it because it's real to life. It's, it's a real um, path that people choose. But what does he say? There's a right choice. And the right choice, he says, enter the narrow gate. It's like Jesus is saying, like, enter here. You see that where you walk up to a place and like, you know, you have a door that they don't want you to enter. They want you to enter here. He tells it. He points it out. There's a right choice. You have the option. But remember, these have two radically different destinations. Now, go back to verse 13 and see that narrow choice. We're like, we know there's a right choice. The right choice is the narrow gate. But we have to ask ourselves a question like, how narrow is this gate? You even see in the text in verse 14 that few find it. Like it really, you've got to ask yourself, have I found this gate? Have I found this start? Have I been one of the ones to see what it is to, to enter in? And we must answer like just how narrow is this gate? And I'll tell you, this will invoke a spiritual claustrophobia in you this morning. Like your heart will feel how narrow it is. And if you look at the sermon as a whole, Jesus has already begun to lay out the spiritual dimensions. We've been through the verses, and, and we're going to go back, and you'll just see how narrow this gate is because Jesus has kind of revealed some of the blueprints to the gate. The first dimension you find is in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 3. It's the start of the Sermon on the Mount, like where we started with who the Christian is. And look at it in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. That kingdom of heaven is a synonym for the life that is found in the narrow gate and the difficult way. And notice the first dimension you get. It is so narrow that to slip through, you must be poor in spirit. In other words, this is such a narrow gate, you cannot go through with all of your baggage. You cannot go through with your sin. The clearances of this gate are so tight that you must recognize that apart from Christ, you have such a great burden of sin upon you that you must be forgiven, washed, cleansed, and made new to have any hope of finding this narrow gate. You can't come through this gate with the baggage of self-confidence, of pride. There is the poor in spirit. The person must realize the smallness of themselves apart from Christ, how lost they are, how great their need is, how un and, um, uh, unable they are to earn access to this gate. You must slide in poor of spirit. You come in, as it were, spiritually naked. You bring nothing of self-confidence, of failure, of sin in through this gate. The poor in spirit enter the kingdom of heaven. But then you come and you pick up another dimension Jesus has given us of how narrow is this gate. Not only to be stripped down, forgiven, and changed. Chapter 5, verse 20, he gives us another dimension that we have spent time in and referred to over the weeks. Remember, he says, I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter where? The kingdom of heaven. That, that life. And so we find dimension one, the poor in spirit. I must be forgiven. I must strip down. I must understand. I have no self-confidence, no pride, nothing that earns access. I'm not like a VIP that gets through. I am, I am a sinner saved by grace. And you see the next dimension that it is so narrow, you must have an exceeding righteousness. You must have a righteousness. It's really a, a right standing before God, a right action and behavior amongst your fellow um, neighbor and humanity that is not of this world. And think of the most righteous people that you know on the face of the earth, and, and apart from Christ, it is not a righteousness in which you'll fit through the gate. It's a righteousness that is not outwardly just seen as good, but you are right before God and then look, you pick up the narrowness yet again. Verse 48 of chapter 5, get the last dimension here. Therefore, 
chapter 5, verse 48, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You must be so stripped down. You must have a righteousness that's not of this world. And you must have a perfection that is attached to the Father in heaven. Guess what you just discovered? Ain't none of us making it through the gate. Right, it just got incredibly small. Like, it's like, I can't even poke a, like my finger through it. How, how do I get through this? You make this, where do I start? You start at this narrow gate and you, you realize, if you find it, it's not paraded about. I, I've, I've got to locate it. How do I get through it? And to take it even further, you would say what the disciples said, like, this is impossible. Further on in the book of Matthew, in chapter 19, Jesus addresses a rich young ruler, and he says that, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than the rich to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's that, you get the idea of how narrow it is. You think of a, a camel being pulled through an eye of a needle from bloody snout to bloody tail. It's a nasty little picture. And his disciples said exactly what we would say. That's impossible. And Jesus says this, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Which asks yourself, how do I get through this? Well, look at the narrow gate and understand this. You know where you find help for the poor in spirit, the forgiveness that you so badly need, a righteousness that's, not above, that's beyond this world, and a perfection that none of us can obtain. It's found in the one who is the gate. Jesus said, I am the door. And he says, you come through me. He says, I am the way. And so look at where do you start? You start with Jesus. You start with a relationship with him. The decision that is before you this morning is a decision of life. And it goes, have I, ha am I one of the few that have found it? You got to say, have you found a relationship with Christ? Have you trusted in him as the one who you came up so spiritually naked and, and poverty strict that he has saved you, forgiven you, washed you, that he is your righteousness, that he is the way and truth in, in life, in your life, that he is the one who was perfect before the Father, living the life you could not live and therefore dying the death that you deserve? Like it starts there. Are you forgiven? Have you been made right in God's sight? Have you been made new? So you see where Jesus is kind of crescendoing together. We descend down. He's like, it's decision time. And the decision starts with me. Have you trusted me? Have you sought forgiveness? Do you know that I died for you? Do you know that I am that gate that can get you through? But now that we've know where to start. It starts with a relationship with Christ, confessing our sin, believing in Him, being made right before Him. We now find ourselves on a path, and it's like, okay, well, how do I get there? Because we're moving to a destination. The second question, how do I get there? And you find in verse 13 and 14, the paths. Just like there were two gates, there's two paths. You see in verse 13, the narrow gate and the wide gate, but you notice the wide gate is attached to a broad way. In verse 14, the narrow gate is attached to a difficult way. So how do I get there? What's the path? It kind of helps us understand the question like, what is the Christian life like when you decide to follow Jesus? So you've been poor in spirit, forgiven of your sins, trusted in him. So it's like, okay, Christ has forgiven me. I, I went to church. I responded to uh, the message. Now what? It's Monday. And Jesus goes, well, how do you get there? Here's your path. You have a broad way or you have a difficult way. Attached to those gates, as you continue to see just two choices, you come first to the broad way. Now think about it. Remember, this broad way, you find that it's well-traveled yet not congested. So it's like everybody has a lane. You're free and unrestricted. There's no checks. You get to just have your lane, have your way, uh, do what you wish. On this way, you can do outwardly righteous. You saw it illustrated in the sermon. Remember how often he called us out on our motives, where outwardly people were doing things that looked good, 
but inwardly their heart was wrong. That can be the Broadway. The commentator John Stott wrote of the Broadway this way. He says, travelers on this road follow their own inclinations. That is the desires of the human heart in its fallenness. Superficiality, self-love, hypocrisy, mechanical religion, false ambitions, critical spirit. These do not have to be learned or cultivated. The broad way, it's simply just living as a human life, living the human life apart from God, doing what you wish, doing some good here and there, coming to church from time to time, and notice what you're on. You're on a, a way that's broad. It's spacious. You're not cramped. There appears to be no effect. I would look at this Broadway. It's like you're on the lazy river of life. And you're moving along and enjoying it and eating and drinking and being merry. The only problem is when we look at the destination, there is a big drop off that that stream is moving to. Eat, drink, be merry because tomorrow you die. Now notice this. How do I get there? The second path attached to the narrow gate. It's described as a difficult way. You've got to appreciate the fact that Jesus is being honest with us. There is an honest aspect that when you trust in Christ and your sins are forgiven, oh, there's such a relief, there's such a freedom, there's such a joy and excitement. But Jesus says, but it also is going to be difficult. It's also going to have its, its restriction or its affliction that will come. And so look at how Jesus lays it out. Verse 14, he says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. Put your finger in verse 14 by that word difficult if you have a paper Bible. If you're using the app, be careful. It'll get away from you. <laughs> difficult there means literally to afflict. Pressing. To pinch. In other words, you see that with the narrow, there's also another word he uses, difficult. This isn't easy. There's a restriction here. There's a pressing that comes upon you. There is a time when it hurts. But remember, we're going to a destination that makes it worth it. Look, if you would please, at this path, difficult is the way. Understand that the way, the path, is temporal. The destination is eternal. And so you think of those moments where you can do hard things and you count down how long you have to do it. You're doing some type of exercise and it burns and it hurts, but you count it down. It's temporal. Like I can go just a little bit longer while this way is difficult. It's temporal. The destination is eternal. And you find the way in which this presses. Notice this path. It's a difficult way. It presses. It pinches. And it pinches in a couple of ways for the Christian first way it pinches or presses is it's the path of truth. The Broadway, open, spacious, everybody gets a lane, go off-roading if you want, enjoy life. But this one, it is clearly defined. It's defined by truth. There's rails that are put up to keep you in the lane. There is this, this guidance of the truth of God's word that keeps you. And at times it may feel like it's restricting, like it's pressing. Think of it this way. In Psalms 119, in verse 5, the psalmist wrote this about God's word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This, this difficult way, this pressing moment in the Christian life is when God's word helps keep clearly defined the path before us. You see, again, it shows up in the Old Testament, like, like this restriction. There is set before you today, Jesus, or the Lord said, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, life and good, death and evil. And the difference, the life and good, is set on those that follow the commands and the statutes and the teachings of God. The Scripture presses you in to keep you going. And think about how difficult that is. There's a lot of things that we want to do or we do that God says, don't do it. It's that pressing. But can I tell you that the sweet thing about this difficult way, this pressing, these, these walls of Scripture, there's such a freedom in it that really is a freedom you might neglect. I put it this way. Have you ever considered that a fish 
is most free when restricted to water. Think about it. You take a fish out of water, and it is not free. It's not Little Mermaid. Right? It's restricted. It's on a frying pan. It's dinner, but you leave the fish, restrict them to water. What happens? They can swim wherever they wish. You have in this difficult way where God puts up and makes very clear the guidelines for freedom. It's not burdensome. It's guidelines. We think so often God gives these commands just to fence me in so I cannot have any fun. Have you ever thought that that fence of his word, what it is keeping out? And those times when you've hopped the fence, think about how severe the bite was. You have this pressing, the the scripture. John Stott will go on to write of this way, and he'll say it's the divine revelation. It's God's word, what he has given us. But if you go back yet again to this difficult way, and you find that word difficult, that affliction, you find that it's a path of persecution. Christian, Christ loves you. He saved you. He forgives you. He receives you. He's faithful to you, but there'll be a lot of people in this world that don't like Jesus, and they're not going to have the same feelings towards you Jesus does. They'll hate you. This difficulty, the affliction, you see Jesus has talked about it as he's calling us to decision. He's addressed it in the sermon. Go back to chapter 5 and find verse 10. Look at this. Remember, we're going to that destination of life or the kingdom of heaven. And remember, just as the poor in spirit is the kingdom of heaven, look at what Jesus says in chapter 5 and verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They have that destination of life. But look at where it is. The difficult path are persecuted for righteousness. Now go look at verse 11. Jesus continues in chapter 5. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And so look at it. It's difficult. There will be people that will criticize you. They will hunt you down. They will speak evil against you. They will lie about you. But what does Jesus say? Like rejoice in that difficulty. You're on the right path. This is illustrated really well in a man in the scripture who gave us like two-thirds of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. Just think for a minute, the Apostle Paul, a man who gave his life for Christ, and it starts in Acts. After he comes and kind of enters through the narrow gate, like he believes in Jesus, the Lord reveals to Ananias about Paul, he says this about the start of his Christian life, he will suffer many things for me. That's a difficult start. He'll suffer many things for me. So right out of the gate, Paul comes into the difficult path and he will suffer for Christ's name. You go a little further in Paul's life in walking the path and he writes to a church in Philippi, a book in our scripture called Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 10, he says this, I'm, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and be conformed to his death. He'll suffer for my name's sake, the start, a little ways into it, his, his plea and pray that I may know the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. And then you come to the end of the road when he is getting ready to finish the path. How do I get there? His destination is before him. And he writes in his last letter, weeks before death, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I also suffer many things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. He saw Christ. He was brought through it. This is a difficult way, but the destination is worth it. Look at an observation here in the difficulty of this persecution. You've got to understand that there's a loneliness that appears to be in it. The narrow gate, few find it. The broad way, many travel it. There is a sense where you've got all those, the populace on the, the broad way, living it up on the lazy river of life. There are moments when they will want to throw rocks at your lonely self on your path. And those rocks will hurt You will feel all alone. You will feel all abandoned. It's true to the one who preaches the sermon. Remember Jesus to suffer the cross? You talk about a difficult path. What happened to all of his disciples? 
peace, I'm out. They left him. Paul writes in that same last letter in 2 Timothy, all have abandoned me. Christ is the only one that there's for me. You see kind of the difficult, so you're like, man, I come to church and you're telling me like the Christian walk is difficult. You are really winning me over to the side. I'm telling you how it is. Because here's where you begin to pick up some things. While the destination is going to be worth it, you've got to note that there is joy in the difficulty. It's true to life that difficult situations refine us and grow us and make us who we are. It is in the difficulty that we discover our true character and our true standing. The famous Russian author Alexander Solzhenitsyn found himself sentenced to a Russian gulag, which was some of the most horrific labor camps to the concentration camps under Nazi Germany. The communist regime of Russia was so brutal towards their people, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn ended up, after his release, writing three volumes exposing um, the communist uh, belief and party and how they treated their people. It was shocking to the world. But in the gulag where he suffered immensely, he wrote this, Bless you, prison. Bless you for being in my life. For there lying upon the rotting prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity, as we are made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. That's why James writes, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. There is a joy of God's work in the difficulty. There is a joy in the fact that Christ is more near in the difficulty. As we started with a couple of poets in that famous poem, I'd like to share with you another one that captures some of the, the joy in this difficult way attached to the narrow gate. How do I get there? through a difficult path. The poem is entitled The Thorn, and it says, I stood a mendicant of God before his royal throne and begged him for one priceless gift, which I could call my own. I took the gift from out his hand, but as I would depart, I cried, but Lord, this is a thorn, and it has pierced my heart. This is a strange, this is a strange, a hurtful gift which thou hast given me. He said, my child, I give good gifts and I gave my best to thee. I took it home and through, at, and though at first the cruel thorn hurt sore, as long years passed, I learned at last to love it more and more. I learned he never gives a thorn without his added grace. He takes the thorn to pin aside the veil which hides his face. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The entrance, where do I start? The narrow gate. How do I get there? The difficult path. But now finally the destination, where am I going? Go back to verse 13 and 14. We've addressed that the way is temporal. The destination is eternal. And you find in verse 13 and 14, yet again, that, that you have in this choice, right, the two options, the two choices. You make the decision. One leads to destruction and one leads to life. Verse 13, the wide gate, the broad way, where does it end? Destruction. Verse 14, the narrow gate, the difficult way, where does it end? It leads to life. Where am I going? 
this is refreshing in those moments of, of struggle, right? You go and you want to go hike uh, to the top of a mountain, and you are laboring on the hike. Like, it is, it is much taller than it looked online, <laughs> right? You're, you're struggling and hiking. You're putting one foot in front of the other. You have ran through all of your hiking snacks. You have eaten like a deer worth of beef jerky, right? All of the trail mix is gone. You even ate the ones you picked and threw aside. You've drank all of your water, the monster you brought, all kinds of things. And it's so difficult. But then when you get to the top, it all comes together. The destination was for that breathtaking view in which you got to see on top of clouds. You're like, okay, it was worth it. This is where, yes, the temporal difficulty leads to this eternal destination in which we'll say, it was worth it. But you've got to see the destinations. The first one is attached to the wide gate and the broad way. You can go easy. You can do what you want. You can play good. You can just, you know, go down the lazy river of life. But notice what he says very clearly that it leads to destruction, verse 13. Now, just like you put your finger on that word difficult, put your word, uh, finger on that word destruction. And know this destruction, it speaks of a complete loss, like a waste, like this is an end that is death, that is damnation. Now, as you're looking at it, destruction, while it's a complete loss, it's never used for annihilation. So it's not like, well, you live it up here and then you die and you just cease to exist. No, the Bible speaks very clearly that the one that lives apart from Christ, their end is damnation. Hell is real. Christ spoke clearly of it. When he preaches of destruction, he is talking about eternal damnation apart from God. But the, but the gate is so wide, everybody gets a lane. There's no restrictions. It's so easy to go down, yes, but do you not hear in the text the rumbling of the white water because you have a spiritual Niagara fall ahead and you fall to death? The Bible speaks of it. In Proverbs 14, 12, there is a path before each person that seems right, but its end is death. It seems right. It's comfortable. It's wide. It's free. It's unrestrictive, but the end is death. Jesus preaches it. You find in Revelation that if your name is not written in the book of life because of relationship with Christ, you are cast into the lake of fire. This would be your best life now, but it's temporal best. Now go to the final destination. It's the destination of life. Here's where we begin to see that this is life abundantly. This is life everlasting. This is life in the one in whom we trust in. This is life that, that is far exceedingly abundantly above what we could ask or what we could think. It's a life that makes all of these little afflictions and difficulties of this world seem like just fading and, and nothing in comparison to the weight of glory. Paul wrote about it. Remember, pretty qualified, like he lived this out. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 through 18, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceedingly and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which have not, are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are not seen are eternal eternal, this eternal life that is to come and this life that can be enjoyed now is the destination of the true Christian. Only the Christian goes through the narrow gate. Only the Christian follows the difficult path. Only the Christian will enjoy this everlasting life. And all of this really points to the preacher of the sermon. There is a, a well-known man in history, especially to the church, by uh, the man by the name Dietrich Bonhoeffer. One of the things that you have to appreciate about him as a Christian is he actually practiced what he preached. He um, was in the United States, though he was from Germany, during World War II, and he was safe. Came from an extremely successful and intellectual family. But his heart for the church for the work of the gospel caused him to return back home to Germany where he ended up being arrested. And tragically, he was one of the last people to die under Hitler's reign. 
He was literally, you could say, hours away from being released, but he was one of the final ones to go to the gallows. Listen to what he writes. He clearly knew the narrow gate. He clearly knew the difficult way, but he also knew the destination of life. He pinned so masterfully, but if we behold Jesus Christ going on before, step by step, we shall not go astray. But if we worry about the dangers that beset us, if we gaze at the road instead of at him who goes before, we are already straying from the path. For he is himself the way, the narrow way, and the straight gate. He, and he alone, is our journey's end. The preacher, Jesus, lays out to us this decision, the entrance, the path, and the destination, and they all point to him. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You come and you realize as he comes to this decision, he's given us this truth. He's laid out the greatest sermon ever, but it only makes sense and is only possible if the impossible with man but possible with God happens, relationship with Christ. And so it says few few will find it. Are you here this morning thinking that you have found a right standing with God because you came to church? Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. Do you think you can pop in and out and kind of off-road? No, difficult is the path. It's a call to abandon all and surrender to Christ. And so you have to ask yourself, have I really let go of this world, laid everything down, put off all of the accolades, all of the focus, and come poor in spirit to Him, knowing that He died on the cross for you? We have our entrance, we have our path, we have our destination. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. As we end, I want to give you There's three points to contemplate as you leave. First, we must live with our destination in sight. Are you living for eternity? Like, do you really consider that you can go home to be with the Lord or this could be your last day? Are you living for here and now? I'd encourage you this week to read Psalms 73. You'll see how important the destination is. Secondly, we must live with spiritual endurance. We run the race with endurance, Hebrews chapter 12. We're not in a sprint, we're in a marathon. The path is difficult, the inclines are steep. We dodge rocks that are thrown at us, but we must have spiritual endurance. It's not one week on, two weeks off. It's not, I'm going to try it for a month. It is complete abandonment of this life and surrender to Christ and enduring all for Him. Third, we must live to warn of the destruction of life without Christ. You find throughout Scripture, Paul was that one who suffered, but he was that ambassador, come back to God. You see Noah, who lived in wicked days, and he endured, but he was a preacher of righteousness, calling people to repent. The drop-off of death is real, hell is real, damnation is real, a life apart from God is real, the destruction is real, and we should warn people, hey, it may seem like a lazy river, but you will hear the rumbling of the white water as you fall to death. But life in Christ is life eternal. Would you bow for a moment of kind of reflection and prayer? And as we get ready to close in prayer, I just want you to realize that the decision of life is before you. Narrow gate, difficult way, a destination of life. A wide gate, a broad way, and a destination of death. There may be within your soul the rumbling of the white water as you realize the way in which you have been living 
is really leading to your demise and your death. Can I tell you that there is a door, there is a way, and there is a life, and it is Jesus. And if you would confess your sin and you would trust in him, he will forgive you and he will make it possible for you to enter in the gate. Father, I thank you that we can come to your word and Father, you consistently and faithfully in your word deal with our day-to-day -day life, our struggles, our experiences, our difficulties, our, our joys. That Father, you address the the real things that we face in life. And Lord, as you brought us to a, a fork in the road and a decision, I pray, Lord, that all of us in here would choose life. That we would endure the temporal to inherit the eternal. That we would understand that this is only possible through a relationship with Christ and that we would surrender all. Father, we... Heed and hear the warning that few will find it. And so we have to ask ourselves, have I, have I found all that Christ offers? But Lord, I thank you that your son has said that he has given his life as a ransom for many. I thank you, Lord, that you are still saving today and you will continue until your work of redemption is complete. And so, Lord, if there are a few in here this morning the need to enter in the narrow gate. May they come to your son, Christ, be forgiven and made, made new. I ask all our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If anybody in this kind of closing moment, you realize that the path that you're on is leading to destruction. If you're aware of the white water of guilt and shame have chilled your soul, you're aware that you're not right with God, but you see today that there's a narrow gate difficult path, but a destination of life, and you're ready to surrender to Christ, would you raise your hand? Is anybody in here you see your need for forgiveness? You see your need to follow after Jesus and be made new, and have the hope of everlasting life with Him? Anybody in this moment, just raise your hand. You're raising your hand to surrender to Christ. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for a reminder that all these truths point to your son. And so, Lord, may we be in right standing with him. May we, Lord, trust in him and walk in obedience to your word, knowing, Lord, that you are leading us to everlasting life. Thank you for the life as believers that we have today, that we are forgiven, that we are made new, that you are with us even to the end of the age. Lord, may we Keep eternity in our sight. May we, Lord, run the race with endurance. And Father, may we warn of the destruction of life without Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us. We pray that you would continue to save and complete your work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's all stand and worship the Lord together. Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praise. May your people
As we uh, bring our service to a conclusion, if you're here this afternoon and you're realizing I'm not right with the Lord, I have not found life in Christ, and you want forgiveness of your sins, and uh, you want a relationship with the Lord, don't run out. Don't go, well, I'm going to try to figure out this gate and way. Let, let uh, the church be here to help you, to point you to Christ, and to answer any questions you have. So if you need to get right with the Lord, you need to get right with Jesus. As we dismiss, right here in the right-hand corner, we've got a follow-up team against the, the back wall there by the exit window. They've got little badges on, and just walk up to them and say, hey, I need to change my path, and uh, they'll know what to do from there to help you in a relationship with Christ. God bless all of you and see you next week.